Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. Let's get this one kicked off with another multiple choice question. So as always, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is C. So what are we dealing with here? Well, this vignette is describing the histology of a niche cow cells, which are associated with rheumatic fever. Now, rheumatic fever is, of course, associated with strep pharyngitis. Now, remember, this is, the, this is most likely to affect the mitral valve. It creates early lesions that can lead to mitral regurge or late lesions that can cause mitral stenosis. Remember, this is immune-mediated. It's not a direct effect of the bacteria. Do you remember what kind of hypersensitivity reaction this is? Type 2. All right, in this condition, we have an M protein that cross-reacts with self-antigens. Now, you can remember the major physical findings with what we call the Jones criteria. This includes joint pain in the form of migratory polyarthritis, heart disease, specifically rheumatic heart disease, which is a late sequela, subcutaneous skin nodules, erythema marginatum, and Sydenham chorea. Now, how can we treat or prophylax against this? Penicillin. Now, the distractors in this vignette all come from bacterial endocarditis, which remember is acutely caused by Staph aureus, but subacutely caused by Viridans streptococci. And this is associated with glomerulonephritis and septic arterial or pulmonary emboli. Now, the most common findings of bacterial endocarditis can be recalled with the mnemonic from Jane. This stands for fever, Roth spots, Osler nodes, murmur. Janeway lesions, anemia, nail bed hemorrhage, and emboli. All right, let's move on to the next question. As always, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is B. All right, what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with pericarditis. Now, the findings of pericarditis are actually pretty easy to identify in a vignette. You'll see fever, chest pain that is sharp and worsens with inspiration, improves with leaning forward, and has that classic friction rub on auscultation. Now typically, when this shows up, we assume it's a viral origin unless there's another likely cause that pops up, pops up like an autoimmune reason, uh, infection, or neoplasm. Now on EKG, we're going to see widespread ST segment elevations and or PR depression. Treatment is going to include the use of NSAIDs in combination with colchicine. Now, don't, for, don't confuse uh, pericarditis with myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the myocardium and is characterized by global heart enlargement and dilation of all chambers. This, unlike pericarditis, can present in a variety of different ways, including with chest pain, fever, breathing difficulties, and arrhythmias. Unlike pericarditis, there are a wide variety of possible causes here that can include viral, bacterial, toxin-induced, parasitic, autoimmune, or it can be caused by rheumatic fever. And there are many complications associated with myocarditis, including arrhythmias, heart block, dilated cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and sudden death. All right, let's move on to the next question. Multiple choice, that means go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. correct answer here is B. Now this is discussing giant cell arteritis, which can be associated with polymyalgia rheumatica. Now we see this mainly in older females, and this is usually going to present with a unilateral headache, temporal artery tenderness, and jaw claudication. Now if they ask you about vasculature, this is most likely and commonly going to affect branches of the carotid artery and will demonstrate focal granulomatous inflammation as well as increased ESR. Now, one of the most worrisome consequences of this condition is the potential for irreversible blindness if it causes occlusion of the ophthalmic artery. Now, if you're asked, how do we move forward with management? We need to ensure that we give steroids prior to biopsy in order to prevent that blindness. Now, another important large cell vasculitis that I want to touch on here and that you need to know is Takayasu arteritis. This typically affects Asian females who are under the age of 40 years. Now, this is also known as the pulseless disease because when we check upper extremities, they're usually very weak pulses. In addition to this, look out for fever, night sweats, myalgia, arthritis, skin nodules, and ocular disturbances. 
Now, looking at this structure microscopically, we're going to see granulomatous thickening and narrowing of the aortic arch and of the proximal great vessels. Now, just as in giant cell arteritis, ESR is elevated, and you can manage this with corticosteroids. All right, let's jump on to the next question. Multiple choice, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is A, Kawasaki disease. Now, let's take a look at the medium vessel vasculitis conditions, which include Bourguer disease, also known as thromboangiitis obliterans, uh, Kawasaki disease, which we are touching on in this question, and polyarteritis nodosa. First, Bourguer disease is strongly linked to heavy smokers. And it's most commonly in males under the age of 40. Now, this is associated with intermittent claudication, and it can actually lead to gangrene. It is extremely important that if this is diagnosed, we get our patient to quit smoking. One of the common associations with this disease is, of course, renal phenomenon, so please watch out for that in a vignette. Kawasaki disease is seen in Asian children and at a very young age, usually under four years of age. And you can remember the common findings with the mnemonic crash and burn on a Kawasaki. Now, this stands for conjunctival injection, rash, which is polymorphous and desquamating, adenopathy, which will be cervical, strawberry tongue, hand and foot changes, and fever. Now the worrisome complication here is the development of coronary artery aneurysms that can lead to thrombosis or rupture, which would be fatal. Now this, if, you, if you've seen any other videos, is the rare instance when we, it is safe to give aspirin to a child. And we need to give IVIG and aspirin. And what are we trying to avoid in most conditions giving aspirin to children? Of course, Rye syndrome. Now, polyarteritis nodosa is a condition that we see in middle-aged men, and it usually affects the renal and visceral vessels. Many patients with this condition are also hep B seropositive, so you really need to keep that in mind and look for that in a vignette. Now, the symptoms here are not very specific. You'll see things like fever, weight loss, headache, uh, malaise, abdominal pain, and melena. A lot of nonspecific stuff. Now, because of those nonspecific findings, you want to be sure to know that the histology will show different stages of transmural inflammation with fibrinoid necrosis. Arteriogram will show a string of pearls appearance. That's something unique you want to remember. Now, as with many other conditions like this, corticosteroids are going to be part of treatment. And for this specifically, we also include cyclophosphamide, which is, of course, an alkylating agent. Now, option B here, Bassett syndrome, is a small vessel vasculitis which is an immune complex vasculitis that's associated with HLA B51, and it's most commonly seen in Eastern Mediterranean and Turkish people. This condition is characterized by the presence of recurring aptuous ulcers, genital ulcerations, uveitis, and erythema nodosum. Please be sure that you recognize that there's an association between this and HSV or parvovirus. All right. I'll talk more about microscopic polyangiitis in a couple minutes when we go over the small vessel vasculitis conditions in a bit more detail. So let's go to the next question. Multiple choice. As always, hit the pause button, figure this out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is D. So what are we actually talking about here? Well, we're talking about a condition known as immunoglobulin A vasculitis, also commonly referred to as henoch scharlein purpura, which, as the question states, is the most common childhood systemic vasculitis. Now, the vasculitis here occurs secondary to IgA immune complex deposition and is also associated with IgA nephropathy. Now, the classic presentation here is a triad of palpable purpura on the buttocks and legs, arthralgias, and abdominal pain. Now, if they ask you about the abdominal pain seen in this condition, don't forget it is commonly associated with intussusception. Now, let's talk about the other small vessel vasculitis conditions that we need to know for our exam. So, option A here, large nodular densities on chest x-ray. This is associated with granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or Wegener granulomatosis. This affects the respiratory tract and the kidneys. Now, in the respiratory tract, specifically the upper respiratory tract, you can see chronic sinusitis, nasal septum perforation, mastoiditis, and otitis media. In the lower respiratory tract, you're going to see cough, dyspnea, and hemoptysis. Now, as it affects the kidneys, you'll see hematuria, and you'll see red cell casts.
And in addition to those findings, there's a common triad of findings associated with, with this condition, and they are A, necrotizing glomerulonephritis, B, focal necrotizing vasculitis, and C, necrotizing granulomas in the lungs and upper airways. Now, option B here, which is increased IgE levels, this is associated with eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. This is also known as what? Churg Strauss. This is characterized by asthma, sinusitis, purpura, peripheral neuropathy, as well it can involve the GI, the kidneys, and the heart. Microscopy shows granulomatous necrotizing vasculitis with eosinophilia, and in addition to increased levels of IgE, we will see MPO anca and P anca. Microscopic polyangiitis is a necrotizing vasculitis that can involve the kidneys, lung, and skin with posse immune glomerulonephritis and palpable purpura. One of the keys to making this diagnosis is the lack of granulomas and the lack of nasopharyngeal involvement. And this is characterized by the presence of anti-myeloperoxidase antibodies. Lastly, we have mixed cryoglobulinemia. This is characterized by a triad of palpable purpura, arthralgias, and weakness, and it's likely caused by a viral infection. Peripheral neuropathy and kidney disease could also be present here. Watch out for that main triad. Now, mixed IgG and IgM immune complex deposition is seen here, as are cryoglobulins. All right, let's move on to the next question. Multiple choice. As always, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is C. All right, let's take a look at the cardiac tumors before we dive into our pharmacology. So, the correct answer to this question was rhabdomyoma, which is the most common primary cardiac tumor in children, and it's associated with tuberous sclerosis. Hamartomatous growths are the characteristic histologic finding of this lesion. Now, myxomas, on the other hand, are, most, are the most common primary cardiac tumor in adults. Now, these are overwhelmingly likely to present in the left atrium. Now, the typical description is a ball valve obstruction in the left atrium and physically gets linked to syncopal episodes. Constitutional symptoms like fever and weight loss are IL-6 mediated in this condition. One of the unique auscultatory findings of this is what's often described as an early diastolic plopping sound. Plopping with an L. Now histologically, look for gelatinous material and myxoma cells immersed in glycosaminoglycans. All right, let's take a break and we will see you on the next lecture, which is pharmacology.